My name is Shannon Biggs. I'm the Community Rights Director at Global Exchange. Greetings from Global Exchange and Occupy Wall Street West, San Francisco, and from the streets of Oakland. And uh, this is my colleague, Ben Price, from the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. um, we're here to share our, our experiences uh, talking about the, the, the work we do in communities um, we, um, to assert the rights of communities over the interests of corporations, um, to strip corporate rights, and uh, respect the rights of nature as well. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here at the epicenter of really the most important thing that's happening in the world right now. Uh, this is a real budding revolution for democracy, and that is the work that we do. Um, we are the 99%, just like all of you, um, and as of the 99%, we're naturally diverse. We're young, and we're old, we're, we cross the political spectrum, we're urban, we're rural, we're overworked, we're underpaid, we're unemployed, and what unifies us as a movement is not just our outrage, but just our outrage against the handful of global rule makers who occupy our streets, but a common goal to change those rules so that they work for the 99% and not the 1%. We, the 99%, seek more than just an illusion of democracy. We want government, real government, in the hands of the people. We want more than the opportunity just to elect the next politician who's going to carry out the corporate agenda. Uh, yesterday, I boarded the plane to come here to New York and just before dawn, and hundreds of police forces swarmed the streets uh, of, of Oakland, swarming my, my comrades uh, in Occupy Oakland, California, with tear gas, with rubber bullets, with flash bombs. Resulted in dozens of injuries and arrests throughout the day uh, and into last night. Other cities are being similarly forcibly swept. We are also here in solidarity uh, with our brothers and sisters uh, in Oakland. And, uh, but it's not just that the cities are being swept. As, as winter approaches, pundits are really questioning, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, do we have the resolve to make it through the winter months? And politicians are desperately trying to flatter us and seek our, you know, seek our, our favor in an election year. Some say, we're some say that we're leaderless, but the truth is, all of us, the 99%, we're all leaders. The power of this moment lies in our refusal to be divided by partisan politics, to stay focused on dismantling corporate rule and taking control of our own structures of government. This is rule by the people. And if we remain united, it's we, the 99%, that are too big to fail. And the occupiers everywhere, occupy uh, uh, every city in the United States and around the world, we've really been able to capture this moment and shift the conversation. And that's a feat that we really can't, you really can't overstate that. And we have the opportunity now to actually shift more than just politicians, but the actual political and economic paradigm that we live under. Um, the paradigm we live under now places corporate interests above our own values of justice and equality. Um, and we're, we're really looking for a new paradigm that, uh, that is about equality, that is about healthy, resilient, vibrant communities, that's about good jobs, that's about what we value. This is our time. Uh, my colleague Ben and I are here, as I said, to talk about our experience from the front lines of a movement for community and nature's rights and the growing number of communi communities that are stripping corporate rights um, out, of, uh, out of their municipalities. And we stand on the shoulders of past people's movements. Those movements sought to, trans to force cultural transformation, social transformation, political and economic transfer transformation. But these were movements for rights. Abolitionists, they didn't seek to regulate slave owners to be kinder to slaves. What they, they fought for was the, for equality and to drive the rights of people into the fundamental structures of law. Suffragettes asserted their rights. Um, they broke the law to cast their ballot. They didn't wait for the law to change. They said, these rights are inherent unto us and, and you know, if, the, if the laws are stopping us and denying our rights, 
um, then we're just going to assert them and we're going to challenge that law because the law is unjust. The laws are meant for we the people, um, certainly not um, they the few. Rights come from creation and by virtue, virtue of being born, uh, we are all equal and therefore rights cannot be granted to corporations. Corporations aren't people, they're, they're, they're not even real, they're a legal fiction created on paper. Um, when we talk about laws, when we talk about just laws, well, they're, institute, they're instituted in order to uphold and protect rights. That's what laws are supposed to do. So when the law denies our rights, the rights of people and nature, it's our responsibility and it's certainly our right to, uh, to change those laws because there are laws. I mean, these are the words that really echo just from the, from the Declaration of Independence from our, our very founding as a nation uh, was predicated on the idea that, uh, that rights are inherent uh, and, and that they do come from by virtue of being born. And when the, the government fails to do its job to uphold and protect those rights, that it's our duty to change them. This is a defining moment right now. If we really seek change, then we must become really the new civil rights mo movement of our time. And in that way, together, we can occupy not just Wall Street, but Main Street and City Hall and occupy everywhere, but deeply, um, not just uh, on the streets, that's, that's where we are now to get attention, but we can go deeper. We can actually occupy our, our streets every day by taking hold of, of, our, of our local governments and eventually higher governments and own them for we the people, not just today, but for every day. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Ben Price to introduce himself a little bit before we dive a little deeper into the work we do and what it looks like on the ground in the communities that we work with. Thanks, Shannon. I'm really pleased to be here uh, with Occupy Wall Street. Um, I come from Pennsylvania where we have occupied Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and communities uh, much smaller across the state. Um, I am Ben Price with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, their project director, and um, I am glad to be here with my fellow 99 percenters. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the kind of work we do, but first um, talk about why it's necessary. And also to thank the folks who began this effort in Occupy Wall Street for creating a space in America and around the world, really, for cultural soul searching. Thank you for reclaiming the enclosures, for making public the tyranny that is the privatization of government, of education, of health care, of labor, of information, of human rights, of nature, and of the whole planet. The monopoly over once public places, over rights and resources by a privileged elite made up of a minuscule number of people possessing a minuscule amount of character, has placed off limits the blessings and benefits of life, of community, of nature, that rightly are the public space available to all. The legalized but fictional rights of corporations with wealth greater than most nations has made of us servants to an economy constructed with the values, with the valves and pipes of laws that pump the value of human labor and the grace of our natural environment into a money-making machine that destroys both and that serves no community, helps none achieve their highest aspirations, makes trivial the efforts of a human lifetime of work, and treats this planet like an open pit quarry for the mining of power and for the disposal of the toxic afterbirth of the corporate state a monster with no soul, whose hunger is greed and whose nourishment is tyranny and inhumanity and global devastation and war. Occupy Wall Street has been accused of not having a coherent set of demands, but that's a lie. Those who cannot hear our manifesto of liberation from the tyranny of corporate privilege and privatization of the earth and its human and natural communities are simply refusing to hear what we're saying. They insist we should become respectable, by which they mean we should surrender to being co-opted by one of the ossified political ideologies that justify the status quo and tell us to work within the system. 
or they hope that we'll hitch our aspirations to one of the political parties, every one of which continues to legitimize the very oppression we seek to end. I'm grateful that Occupy Wall Street and all of the other occupations of public places around the world has chosen to think outside the box of the culture that seeks to incorporate the world into a vast plantation of beholden and desperate workers with no legal claim to anything except a few appetites that this mutation of human culture promises to satisfy with pixels on flat screens and food that's not really food. The governments that make laws in our names serve the 1%. They disrespect us, exercising corporate naming rights in order to define us as consumers of the commodities made by our own hands under the command and control of the corporate state. Never does the corporate hegemony over government, trade, community, and nature define us as citizens or as people with inalienable rights. Never do they define nature and the environment as the common ground of our health upon which we depend for survival. No, nature is defined as property and resources. Nature is treated as a slave with no rights, and its owners claim the sacred legal right of property ownership as justification to rape it, bludgeon it, poison it, and kill it. Only, or I'm sorry, but once fully privatized, the planet is to be converted into commodities and surplus wealth for that 1%. The Occupy Wall Street campaign can be transformed into a community rights movement intent on changing all of this. But to create the world we want to live in and to hand off to our descendants, we will have to make systemic changes, not just cosmetic ones. We will have to act with confidence, assurance of our rights to act beyond the limits of a system of law that is stacked against us and in favor of the corporate elite. We can't make better regulations for corporations. If there are to be corporations, we have to govern them from the moment they're created in our name by the issuance of corporate charters until the day we decide to revoke those charters because it is in our power to do so. So how can we accomplish this? Well, that's what we need to talk about next. And what I'd like to do is talk more specifically about the challenges that face us. Uh, we organized, both Shannon and I, and the organizers with uh, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund and Global Exchange, we organized directly in communities to address the challenges and to act locally because it seems impossible to move our state legislatures and the federal government to act on our behalf. They're constantly acting on behalf of that the folks we've identified as the 1%. So what I'm suggesting and what we're suggesting is that we need to change from Occupy Wall Street, and it has already happened, to Occupy Everywhere. And the next step would be to occupy our hometown governments, to take them on and to transform them into the tools for our convenient self-governance. So we want to talk about what we refer to as place-based community rights organizing. This people's gathering, this, this um, Occupy Wall Street, is trying to discover why it is that it's illegal for people in our hometowns to be the stewards of our human and natural communities, the places where we live. Why is it illegal, apparently, for us to make decisions on issues such as global warming? Why is it illegal for us to create sustainable communities or sustainable energy policies, sustainable water policies, sustainable food and agriculture policies? Why is it illegal? And there are specific reasons. We have to look at what the main obstacles are that are created by the corporate state which prohibit us from self-governance, from community stewardship, from stewardship of our environment and the creation of sustainable policies in the places where we live because that is where we actually have to experience them in the communities where we live. The legally erected obstacles 
to community and people's rights and nature's rights come from the law of this nation and of our states. They come from corporate privileges defined as corporate personhood by the federal government and the federal courts. State preemptive laws which outlaw communities and municipal governments from adopting laws that prohibit corporations from violating the rights of community members. That's a large challenge that in our organizing we have to face. And the communities we're working with are taking that on and enacting local laws that actually challenge state preemptions and the claims of corporate personhood, corporate rights under the Constitution. We have a problem with parts of the Constitution such as the Commerce Clause that says only the Federal Congress can regulate corporate behavior as corporations enter our communities and propose to engage in activities that would violate our rights. That is a fundamental usurpation of self-governance in the place where we live. So what we're talking about is a call to action. It's an incitement to democracy. It's a challenge to each one of us to change the structure of law, beginning in the place where we live. Current law says the people and communities affected by governing decisions are legally forbidden from making them, especially if they interfere with the interests and claimed rights of corporations. This is a historical moment, the moment of Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Everywhere. This is an alarm clock for the 99% who have been asleep in their communities. It is time for them to arouse. We are here today to say that if we're the ones we've been waiting for, then we shouldn't wait any longer. It's time to subordinate corporations to the governance of the people, in whose name the state where you live charters those corporations and creates them and empowers them to come into your community and in fact licenses them to violate the rights of the members of your community, of yourself, of your family, and to destroy your natural environment. There's no legitimate argument for us to delay any longer. We must occupy our local governments, not just the green spaces and the places where they allow us to gather without being molested. It is time to occupy the governments closest to us. We must enact local laws that strip corporations of court-bestowed privileges that make them into super citizens. In the communities where we live, that's where we have to start. We must adopt local community bills of rights and we must ban, prohibit, and constrain corporations from entering our communities against the consent of the governed, licensed and permitted by state legislators and by the federal Congress. We must not wait for our state legislators or for Congress to do the right thing. They won't do it. The time is now to occupy our hometown governments. It's time to sit at the lunch counter of local democracy and demand to be served. It's time to refuse to give up our seats at the front of the democracy bus. These aren't theoretical tasks. This isn't pie in the sky. These are the necessary steps to create a people and community and nature's right movement, to subordinate corporations and their elected representatives to the will of we the people, we the 99%. And I'd like to ask Shannon to talk a little bit more specifically about what kind of work has been done in the communities uh, where we've been organizing? Thanks, Ben. Um, about a decade ago, when I first came to Global Exchange, uh, I came uh, in search of one thing, which was to find the silver bullet um, to what was it going to take for our communities to really get what it was they want in the places where they lived. Uh, so I set off to study about 2,000 community struggles across the United States to really see uh, what it was that they were doing right, what they were doing wrong, uh, what, what their challenges were. And the good news was that 10 years ago, nobody thought 2,000 communities existed that were, uh, that were looking to um, change, change what was happening in the place where they lived. So that was the good news. 
the bad news was that of those 2,000 uh, community struggles that I looked at, um, about 80% of those were actually losing. Uh, and the 20% that were, quote, winning, um, were really defining victory based not on what the community wanted, but what we thought we could get. And to me, that was, that was really discouraging. So I, I, I sent about to really kind of reorganize my task and to say, uh, what was it that was standing in the way of, of communities um, not just having some kind of a victory, but really you know, getting what they want? Well, you know, as it turns out, a lot of the communities that were winning were really winning based on you know, lucky breaks or uh, things that were really out of their control. Uh, sure, that you know, we spend a lot of time um, doing work around corporate accountability, um, but in, in terms of um, our, you know, the, the job of making corporations better, better community <clears throat> citizens, we're really losing uh, by, uh, by a, a wide swath. Uh, these corporations were interested in good PR. They weren't really interested in changing, fundamentally changing their, their practices. And when I looked at the communities that were losing, I thought, well, are the people and the 80%, are they not organizing enough? Are they not organizing right? And really they were doing just the same things that, the, that those that were quote unquote winning were doing. Um, and what I found was it what's not even really the corporations that were standing in the way of people getting what they want. It's the law itself. In 2,000 communities across the United States, I looked at in rural communities, urban cities, um, uh, all, uh, all manner of kinds of struggle. And again and again and again, it was the law itself. It's the law that says that, um, that gives the permits for, uh, for corporations to come into our communities. It's the, it's the law that says that corporations have rights of personhood, rights of other constitutional protections and privileges, and uh, meaning that, they, that we can't stop them from coming into our communities uh, and making sacrifice zones of uh, our, our local communities and nature. Uh, so uh, when I started to really take a look at this, and it really, really dawned on me that the laws, it's, it's sort of like going to a casino. Um, the rules, sure, every now and then somebody wins. If somebody didn't win a little bit of their money back, you know, nobody would play. Uh, but we've been good citizens. We've been playing by the rules for years. We've been playing by the rules uh, because we believed that the laws were there to protect us. What we're really discovering now and what Occupy Wall Street is really uncovering is something very, very different, that the laws are meant to protect the 1%, and they're all written that way. So when we get a, a, a victory and we save one little space uh, of something, what we've done is fracture our resources because everybody's working on separate harms, and we're missing out on the, the big picture where so much is being lost. So for every small victory, we feel so good about it, and, 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 and lots of things have been saved and protected by that. But when we take a step back, we have to realize on the big picture what has been lost. And it was at that point when I, I found a community that was really up to doing something different. The very first community uh, I saw was in a small town in Pennsylvania that, uh, that wrote an ordinance that, uh, that said within the, this municipality, uh, corporations are not persons. And certainly out of the 2,000 struggles that I looked at, that was by far the most, uh, certainly the most radical thing that I had seen in order to affect change. And it was so right on the nose. And I thought, where did, the, where did a small rural community in bush voting, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, um, come to such a radical position? Uh, it was a surprise to me. Uh, and the people that they were working with, of course, was the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Since that time, um, there are now over 120 municipalities who uh, have enacted laws that challenge state preemption, that challenge corporate supremacy. Uh, we're not talking about resolutions uh, that, that have no legal, you know, legal bearing. We're talking about enforceable local laws. Over 120 communities have passed these ordinances, including Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which I know Ben is going to uh, talk a little bit sure. um, more about. But 
uh, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of over 600,000 plus people in the United States who are already living under this new system of law that puts them in charge of the decisions in their communities. And that's real power and that's what we're here to, to talk to the, uh, the people who have created this moment uh, about, is to share the examples of, 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 and lessons that we've learned. One of the things that we've, you know, that when I talk about those 80% of communities, I'm talking about, uh, by and large, regulatory law because the law doesn't allow us to ban the unwanted activities. It doesn't allow us to say no to fracking or uh, mountaintop removal. It's, that's legal. Fracking is legal. It, mountaintop removal, blowing the tops off of mountains, is perfectly legal under our system of law. That's crazy. Uh, how else but in a system of laws that were written for the corporations could that exist? Who would who would otherwise, who in the 99% would pass such uh, that kind of a, a law? When we talk about regulatory law, regulatory law comes, uh, is the system that we've been given to work with. And we, we talk about it a lot, but really when we talk, who writes the regulatory laws? Uh, was interesting in, uh, you know, in, the Gulf, uh, in, the, in the Gulf oil spill, uh, the government said, well, we don't know anything about oil spills. Who do they go to? They go to... BP, the corporation that created the problem in the first place, and it's not just around oil mining, it's about everything. They go to the experts, and the experts are the industries themselves who write the regulations that we have to follow. That's the way the regulatory system works. It doesn't regulate corporations, it regulates our behavior, and it puts what we can do in a really tiny box uh, and says that uh, you can't say no, but you can, you can uh, make it less bad. What it's doing is legalizing the harm, allowing the harm to come into our communities, to make us all sacrifice zones, our communities, our people, and uh, the environment in which we live. And if we don't change those, those rules, uh, well, we're running out of time. It's, it's, it's time for us not only to change our ideas about um, who's regulating who, but who's really in charge. Uh, and, and this is the opportunity uh, to really change business as usual. We're told that there must be a balance between regulation and so-called development, but there is no such balance. By, we've had 40 years of environmental regulation just to take one piece of regulatory law. 40 years of environmental regulation later, we're worse off by every single environmental indicator than we were 40 years ago. What does that tell us about the direction that we're headed? And that the gap between rich and poor is only getting wider. Uh, the uh, environment is only getting um, more and more dangerous. It's time to really put power in the hands of the people if we want uh, a planet to protect uh, and, a, and a place to live. Um, the rights-based organizing model that has been adopted by, uh, in local communities, we've been working with local communities to, uh, to adopt ordinances that recognize the rights, of the, uh, the rights of the community itself, to say that here within our municipality, here within our borders, we make the rules about the kind of place that we're going to live. They strip the corporate protections that are, that those, those, uh, those privileges and protections that allow corporations to come in. They strip those rights. They're not saying no corporations. What they're saying is corporations don't need, don't deserve, and don't have the same rights as, as human beings. They're not, they don't have the same rights as nature. Corporations are a legal fiction. Certainly, to, to do, you can come and do business in our town, but you are not empowered to rule our town and to make decisions over and above uh, the, the people in our community. Uh, ben is working with uh, a, a number of communities um, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, these laws do a number of things. They strip the, the, the corporations of the protections. They strip them of property claims to future unearned profits. Um, as we're working with communities in Pennsylvania, in New York, in California, in Washington State, in Maryland, in New Hampshire, am I missing anything? Uh, and, and a number of other states. We're working internationally uh, around the rights of nature. We're uh, assisting uh, communities. Uh, I'm working with a community in Durban, South Africa. Um, 
the Legal Defense Fund uh, provided assistance to help the, the nation of Ecuador insert the rights of nature into, uh, write the language to insert uh, that into their constitutional framework. Uh, this is a movement whose time, uh, I mean, we're really at the time, uh, the, the precipice, and we need you to join us. We, we, we were here uh, to, to suggest to not just occupy Wall Street, but occupy everywhere. Uh, and, and let you know that there is a place to go for, if, uh, for the kind of assistance that really takes a stand to say we can be Rosa Parks in our own communities. We can stand and assert our rights because the rights belong to us. They're ours. And the laws deny us those, anytime the law is denying us those rights, it's time to change the, it's time to stand up, it's time to not just stand up and be counted, but to actually make it count in the places where we live. Um, corporations have rights, and it's uh, illegal for corporations and communities to prohibit corporations acting without impunity. Uh, no more. Not in our communities. Um, the, the, only by challenging the legalization of the denial of these fundamental rights of people and of nature and of communities we bring about the kind of change needed. We can become stewards of our environment uh, based on very different criteria by our experience of living in a place, uh, by the values that a community holds, uh, rather than corporations making those decisions for us based on a very different set of interests and values. Um, we can create the kinds of vibrant, local, resilient economies that we want. If it weren't for the structure of law we have now, that's what we'd be doing. So it's time to recognize that, you know, what's an economy for if it's not to serve the needs of the community? It's time to restructure all of those things. If the law's only purpose is to remove all of the obstacles pr uh, proposed democratically by the people to the endless centralization of power, of wealth, then it is time for we the people, and as Ben likes to say, we the rabble, we the 99%, to overturn these laws and make a community of communities that serves our ends and not the, not the desires of the privileged 1%. I'm going to pass it over to Ben to talk a, a little bit more about what, we, what needs to do in order to make this happen. Thanks, Shannon. And it, it, to be clear, this is not theoretical talk. We're not at the position of trying to define what needs to happen. Um, we think we understand what the problem is. And again, as those who might say that uh, Occupy Wall Street um, doesn't have a coherent message, um, I think that the message is so, um, and the problems are so systemic that to simplify them would not do them justice. But we have communities that we're working with, and Shannon works with communities in California and elsewhere uh, doing the same type of work um, that we've begun in Pennsylvania. Um, Shannon mentioned Pittsburgh, and so I'll use it as an example because this is the type of law that we're talking about. And then I want to talk about what you can do in the community where you live. Uh, this past November, November 16th, 2010, um, after about six or seven months of working directly with city council uh, and working directly with members of the community to organize them to get behind the proposed measure, um, the city council of Pittsburgh unanimously adopted a community bill of rights a Bill of Rights that includes the right to local self-government, an inalienable right, the right of the people to use their local government to protect the community's rights, their health, safety, and welfare, and their natural environment. It recognized a right to water. It recognized the rights of nature. Pittsburgh is the largest uh, U.S. Um, community to recognize the rights of nature and these other rights, but we now have, I'm not sure what the number is, 25 or so other communities that have done so across at the least. nation, at least 25, that have actually recognized that nature, natural communities and ecosystems have a fundamental right to exist and flourish, and that members of the community have the authority and the legal standing to go to court to advocate for those rights and to vindicate those rights under law. This is new law. Um, beyond that, uh, using the Pittsburgh example, um, their concern had to do with that um, extraction of natural gas referred to as fracking. 
um, pumping uh, millions of gallons of toxins uh, with uh, lots of fresh water into the ground to force natural gas up and to bring that, a lot of nasty stuff up with it. Um, Pittsburgh adopted as part of their Community Bill of Rights a prohibition on corporations engaging in the extraction of natural gas within the city. Beyond that, they included provisions that stripped any corporation that would violate that prohibition of claimed constitutional protections, of Bill of Rights protections, of protections um, under the Commerce Clause and the Contracts Clause. Now, I've sometimes heard people say, well, that's Pittsburgh. That's, a, that's kind of a pretty good sized city. What can a little community like ours do in the rural communities? As it turns out, um, many of the communities that have passed ordinances on different issues other than fracking have done exactly the same thing to protect them, their communities from corporate assaults. At this point, we have about eight other municipalities that have adopted the Community Bill of Rights that bans fracking, and that includes communities in New York State, in Pennsylvania, and in Maryland. We expect that perhaps soon we'll see some of those adopted in Ohio as well and more in New York State. I want to be clear about one thing. It's not just environmental issues that we're talking about. Uh, Rights-based organizing is not just about environmental harms brought by corporations. Uh, we wouldn't have a fracking problem, for instance, in Pittsburgh if we didn't have a democracy problem. We wouldn't have a factory farm problem throughout the regions of uh, rural Pennsylvania and elsewhere if we didn't have a democracy problem. If the people directly affected by governing decisions were recognized by U.S. and state laws to have the authority to make those governing decisions and to pass local laws to protect their health, safety, and welfare, we would not have those symptoms of the violation and the stripping of the right to self-government in the communities where we live. We would not have fracking problems. Um, we would have democracy. We would have local self-government. It's the denial of that right that actually allows these many, many symptoms of the, the single issues to arise in our communities. So here's the question. In your community, what's the issue? What is it? What rights are being deprived or what symptoms are you seeing? Um, is it perhaps not an environmental issue? Maybe it has to do uh, with workers' rights on the job. Maybe it has to do with fair wages, living wages. Um, why is it, for instance, that the right to own a corporation means that you can legally strip all of the workers of their federal constitutional rights when they enter the workplace? because of your private property interests, when they walk across the threshold in the morning for their, the beginning of their workday, they lose their First Amendment rights, free speech. They r lose their right to assembly. They lose their right uh, to be protected from unwarranted search and seizure so that their phone conversations can be listened to, so that their um, emails and so forth can be uh, examined, so that their bodies can be searched and they can be compelled to give samples of their, um, their urine, for instance. Um, why is it uh, that there can be a constriction on the right to free assembly on, in the workplace so that unions can be stopped from being formed? Um, what if in your community you created a community bill of rights and you advocated and organized to have that passed into law locally so that every worker appearing on the job would find that their constitutional protections actually are transportable across the threshold when they go to work. What if you want to, for instance, prohibit the privatization of your water supply in the community where you live? This, uh, these are things that could apply to New Yorkers, uh, to folks in the boroughs, to folks across the state in smaller communities, this is about self-government by the people directly affected. It's community rights organizing, and it's not limited to particular issues. The real issue is the fundamental right to determine your future and the right to create sustainable communities 
which are at the moment illegal. What are we going to do about it? It's not just about majority rule in your community either. This is, these, are, these are about protecting the rights of all of the communities equally. Um, some say uh, that these ordinances can be used or misconstrued uh, to do something very different. And to, but uh, when you're talking ab about rights, and when you really have the, the, this is, when we work in these communities, it's about a cultural transformation that takes hold in that community to really own our rights. Uh, the, the colonization that has really taken place uh, and uh, that has made us so obedient to laws that deny us our fundamental rights. Um, this, this moment and Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Everywhere has really created a, a fundamental shift and our challenge really is, how can we take that moment, seize, seize that opportunity uh, to really dive deeply into, uh, into the, the culture of our communities to say, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, can we do that? Is that, is that okay? Uh, as if we were waiting for permission from the 1% to seize control. It's not going to happen. We're going to have to create this for ourselves. This is the moment when we talk about we're the ones we've been waiting for. We're the ones we've been waiting for right here in the places where we live. This is our opportunity to, uh, to create a, a local bill of rights that reflects the values of your communities. Uh, they're, so, they're so different. The things that bring people to this work uh, from Mount Shasta, California, where they're you know, seeding the clouds with toxic chemicals in order to make it rain uh, uh, more heavily for, for Pacific Gas and Electric Corporation uh, to, to, to basically change the atmosphere, to steal rain. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, um, when we talk about regulations, that's actually unregulated in the state of California. And in fact, when we look at the tar sands and the, the work coming in through the pipeline, all of the regulations and environmental protections, um, the, the tar sands violates, the, the pipeline violates the, those uh, regulations all along the way. And what you're seeing are those regulations just being uh, put in abeyance or overturned uh, or, or ignored, uh, despite mm -hmm. the efforts of communities to use the, the existing law to protect, their, uh, to protect their rights and to protect their spaces. It, what does it mean to be exempt from a law? It means to be above it. And that's, it's the very industries, the corporations involved in various activities that get exempted from the laws that would matter. And usually those laws aren't very, very strong anyway. The regulations aren't really very protective of communities and the environment anyway. And yet, and, and, and they're also, also, as right. Shannon said earlier, generally written by the regulated industry. Generally, yeah. And so uh, to exempt those very corporations from the minuscule protections that are offered is to say that the corporations are above the law, although the people are not. Communities in like Santa Monica are looking, uh, to, they're, they're actually a, a city that wants to be a model of sustainability and are finding that the law itself actually stands in the way of creating sustainable communities. That's crazy. Uh, and, and so they're beginning uh, what is probably going to be you know, a, a slower path. This is sort of a, an evolution, an evolutionary next step that's being taken. The first communities that passed these ordinances were actually afraid of something uh, uh, more you know, apparently scarier than a lawsuit uh, for, for their communities. They're, they're actually afraid of, of the toxicity of, of the, the activities that, that are permitted by law. Um, and. Uh, and and, and th that the community could rally around those points in your community, what is that issue? Or are you a community like Envision Spokane, uh, Spokane, Washington, or, uh, uh, you, you know, or in um, Santa Monica that are actually sort of looking the next level up to say, actually sustainability is urgent. If we don't begin to live sustainably, um, you know, we're, we're all headed to a very different path and really breaking ground uh, for a new way of thinking to say, uh, you know, if the laws are prohibiting us from being safe in our communities, from achieving you know, a, a, a safe and healthy community for our generation, for the next generation, 
then those laws need to be changed. That is what every movement for rights, every struggle for rights has been about. And the first step is really recognizing uh, that, uh, that we have those rights and feeling empowered to assert those rights. The, the work we do with communities is uh, to really take a deeper look. One of the tools we use, we have a, a, a two-day democracy school uh, that, uh, that CELDEF puts together. You can find out information on that from uh, the CELDEF website, www.celdf.org. Um, uh, you can contact me at Global Exchange. I'm uh, Shannon Big, so I'm Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, at globalexchange.org. Uh, and, and we're ready to take the next step with communities. We want to engage new communities because this isn't just about one community standing up any more than it was about Rosa Parks being alone on the bus. This is about hundreds and thousands eventually of communities holding, holding hands together under a new understanding under a redefinition of the problem uh, uh, to, assert our, to assert our rights and stand together as the new civil rights struggle for, for this generation. And, you know, we, we have just very few choices. Um, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Everywhere. It's clear that there's kind of a visceral sense of how bad things are and that our rights are being denied and that we're being forced to serve a machine that does not serve us and that things are upside down. The options we have are, are pretty limited. I think of, of them as three. You can decide to do nothing. That's the first choice. As a community, as an individual, you can decide to do nothing. But there are consequences. Um, the first is that, you know, if we're the adults in the room, uh, we have to be, we may not be around, but we are, in a sense, answerable to the kids and to the generations to come after us um, to really be responsible for what things look like when it's their turn. And if we, we don't lead, have the right to give their rights away. We absolutely do not have the right to give their rights away. But that might be a choice that's made. I'm too busy. I'm too poor. I'm too whatever it is. I'm afraid I might get sued. I don't want to lose my car or my house. I might get jailed. I can't break the law. It's the law. All of the arguments for doing nothing um, lead to one, one result, and that is whatever the proposed corporate assault is will happen and your community will suffer the outcome. And what the statement is that you make is, I recognize I don't have the right to say no to corporations, and I do recognize that they have superior rights to me and to my commu community members. The second option that you can try, and many people do, and it's been really the, the strategy that's been used by environmental activists, labor activists, all kinds of activists over the years, um, and that is kind of a reform attitude. Let's try and make the existing law work for us. Let's see if we can enforce the regulations that are on the books. Let's try to have the permits denied. Of course, the permits are issued as a matter of right, not as a matter of discretion. Having them denied is pretty tough. Um, in the end, what we've concluded is to work within the structure of law that exists is to admit that we don't have a right to say no to the corporate assaults. It's to admit that we don't have the fundamental rights that we were born with anymore and that corporations can govern us and that government will represent those corporations and not us. That's the second option and the outcomes aren't very satisfying. The third option is to assert your rights. It's what we're proposing. The third option is to take seriously that you were born with certain inalienable rights that nature has a right to exist and flourish, and that whether it's law or not, corporations and property do not have rights that can be used to trump the rights and, and interests of communities and of nature. And it's time to actually put that idea into law, and that's what we're about. So we invite you to join us. We ask you to invite us into your community to assist. And you can contact me 
Uh, my name is Ben Price at the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, website is www.celdf.org and my email address is Ben Price, all one word, Ben Price at celdf.org. And I hope to hear from you. I'm sure Shannon does too. Come check us out at www.globalexchange.org. <laughs> Can we take a question? Sure. One thing, and then I'll turn it over to, to Ben, is to say that in all of the communities that have passed these ordinances, uh, and, and most of them have been to stop some unwanted harm, uh, the, the communities that first came forward in Pennsylvania after uh, two young boys uh, died as a result of exposure to sewage sludge, um, those communities passed these ordinances uh, and stopped the sludge from coming in. They asserted their right to say no to toxic sludge spreading uh, and, to, and, and to strip the rights from corporations that would come in and actually sp spread that sludge. Um, so in every one of those communities, not one teaspoon of sludge has, has entered those communities. In those places that said no to water withdrawal, not one drop of water has been taken by a corporation. Um, and in Pittsburgh and other places, it puts a barrier to say you know, to, to to stop the you know to stop the fracking. Um, so the first thing that these ordinances do, uh, generally speaking, is actually it, it serves two purposes. One is to uh, to 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 really assert those rights within the communities, uh, but also it actually stops the nasty thing that was coming into the community. And, and that has been the experience. Yeah, it's, it's not theoretical. Um, with Pittsburgh, um, they already had leases on um, land within the city, uh, leased out to the drillers. Uh, matter of fact, there were already existing wells, but they were the shallow, the non-fracking wells. Um, and so what the city did, rather than shut them down, and they weren't really very um, active at any rate, they grandfathered them in, of course, with, that, with the exception that they could not be transformed into fracking wells, uh, which would be the, you know, in, in other words, there, were, there was clearly some intent of industry um, to take advantage of every inch of ground they could in the state. Um, in the sludge issue, and, and what uh, Shannon's talking about for those who aren't familiar with the agricultural application of sewage sludge to farmland, um, it's urban waste. It includes nasty stuff, including um, hospital waste, hospital waste, and industrial, industrial waste. solvents and PCBs, and you name it. Things that go down the drain from anywhere are collected all in the same place. Um, the water is removed and allowed to go back into the streams and rivers, and the, the solid materials um, is trucked out into our rural communities, uh, where the state has legalized the application of that to, to farm fields. Um, under the pretense that it's now somehow turned into fertilizer. That's, uh, that's a nasty thing. And it actually, the, the ordinances did prevent uh, any of the corporations from bringing that in. The, we, ha we have some other, other examples, but we have issues on the ballot uh, for this November. Looking at the Community Bill of Rights for um, what's being proposed in places like Santa Monica, that sort of next step, uh, ordinances, what they want to do is they want to, you know, they want to be able to preference, uh, you know, they want to change their, their, their way their food works, the way water uh, works. They want to say, hey, we're a city in Santa Monica and we know we paved over everything. Uh, we draw our water from somebody else's uh, watershed. How do we become not only self-sufficient, uh, sustainable, but self-sufficient in our water use? And finding that, uh, you know, the mechanics of being able to actually do that 
are prohibited by law. The, in a state that is as drought-ridden as California, uh, that seems you know, really pretty crazy. Um, they want to be able to get their food go into, and to preference food from a local food shed. And they, the laws don't allow that to happen. So one of the things that this ordinance will do will actually allow them to become self-sufficient uh, and, and bypass the laws that actually make it difficult or impossible to become self-sufficient in uh, oil, uh, I mean uh, oil, in energy, uh, uh, and to be able to, um, to have you know, power for the people that's clean, that's green, uh, but that's also uh, not something that the corporations have put out, but something that they actually municipally controlled, that they, can, uh, that they know what's in their stores, that they know where the food comes from, and that they can say where uh, it comes from. So they've actually <coughs> been putting together policies. How would we actually get there? And it's those steps that are currently not possible under the current structure of law. So it's about changing the law to say, uh, you know, this is, this is the way we want our community to be. We want to be a model of sustainability, but not just in name. We actually want to do it. Uh, so those are the kinds of, uh, it, it, it's anything that the community can imagine for themselves uh, that is about uh, respecting the rights and equality uh, for the community and everybody in it and for future generations. Uh, but also to, to say, we also want to be stewards of our local environment because we don't trust uh, Nestle Corporation or, uh, you know, a, a mining corporation to do it. Um, and of course, right under, under the current law, that's exactly who's making the decisions about what are, you know, what in our community, uh, what happens in our community and how it looks. And um, these communities are changing that. And, and in practical terms, I mean, we, we've talked about how corporations having uh, court-bestowed constitutional rights um, makes it impossible for us to have sustainable communities. Um, in practical terms, the reason for that is because the lawyers for corporations enter our communities and threaten our local lawmakers with lawsuits, threaten to bankrupt our local municipal governments if we dare to pass a law that would, according to these uh, corporations and their attorneys, that would violate the civil rights of the corporation, that would violate, for instance, their Fifth Amendment protections against government takings. That's one of the arguments used regularly. Um, the argument there is that corporations, as persons, have constitutional protections under the Fifth Amendment, bill, uh, under the Bill of Rights, Fifth Amendment, which says, in part, that government can't take private property for a public use without just compensation. What does that mean? Well, it means that you can't pass a law to protect the interests and rights of your community if that means you're going to take the property of the corporation. What does that really mean? It means, apparently, the privileges of corporations are superior to the rights of the members of the community. So we do have to change fundamental law. We have to challenge it and change it. And let's start where we, where we live. Let's start there.